Chapter 6 of The Call of the Wild is titled, For the Love of a Man. When John Thornton froze his feet in the previous December, his partners had made him comfortable and left him to get well, going on themselves up the river to get out a raft of saw logs for Dawson. He was still limping slightly at the time he rescued Buck, but with the continued warm weather, even the slight limp left him. And here, lying by the river bank through the long spring days, watching the running water, listening lazily to the songs of birds and the hum of nature, Buck slowly won back his strength. In this particular passage, we want to notice that there is a parallel drawn between John Thornton and Buck. John Thornton starts off uh, with a limp, meaning that he is wounded. Buck has been mistreated for so long that he also is in no shape to be able to do anything well. He's near death. He's so skin and bones. But notice that once they have joined together, they both begin to recover. They not only begin to recover, but notice that it's with the warm weather and long spring days. Authors use settings almost as symbolic of a change within the text for us to notice. So if winter is the time that things die off, and winter is a necessary thing to be able to bring about change for the better, spring is then when you have new life or rebirth or the start of something. So here, John Thornton and Buck have now been able, with the coming of spring, been able to forge a relationship and also both renew their spirits and their physical abilities. That's worth paying attention to. A rest comes very good after one has traveled 3,000 miles, and it must be confessed that Buck waxed lazy as his wounds healed. His muscles swelled out, and the flesh came back to cover his bones. For that matter, they were all loathing, Buck, John Thornton, and Skeet and Nig, waiting for the raft to come that was to carry them down to Dawson. Skeet was a little Irish setter who early made friends with Buck, who, in a dying condition, was unable to resent her first advances. She had the doctor trait which some dogs possess, and as a mother cat washes her kittens, so she washed and cleansed Buck's wounds. Regularly, each morning after he had finished his breakfast, she performed her self-appointed task till he came to look for her ministrations as much as he did for Thornton's. Nig, equally friendly, though less demonstrative, was a huge black dog, half bloodhound and half deerhound, with eyes that laughed and a boundless good nature. Again, with our practice, we are trying to ensure that we read carefully. So there are a few things here that we all should, also should point out. First and foremost, we have Skeet and Nig introduced. These, we learn, are dogs. An Irish setter is a dog, and bloodhound uh, and deerhound are both dogs as well. So an Irish setter... Um, I get the mental picture of a little uh, red dog, but I'm not 100% sure. So because I have the availability of technology, I'm going to look it up. I want to get a mental picture. Oops, I spelled puppy wrong. Hey, I was right. There we go. There's an Irish setter. That is literally what I had in mind. They're a beautiful uh, ruby color, almost copper-ish, if you will. And they tend to grow up to be medium-sized dogs. They're not super, super heavy, but they do have long, thick coats that would help them. And a bloodhound deerhound. Bloodhound deerhound mix. Okay. So lots of different uh, examples here. I'm going to guess that it would be one with the, the longer coat because we know that the animals that would have made it up to 
uh, Alaska would have been more the ones with the thicker, heavier coats to protect them from the snow. So now we have a picture of the two different dogs. And it's important to note that Jack London spends time giving a little bit of uh, a little bit of their personalities. So he's developing the character traits, which are significantly different than the character traits of the dogs that Buck knew from the previous five chapters. These two are friendly, as friendly as John Thornton seems to be. So much so that Skeet uh, has a doctor trait. Obviously, she's not a doctor. Dogs don't have that ability. But some dogs just like to lick you and take care of you. And as a mother cat washes her kittens, here's a bit of a simile. So she washed and cleansed Buck's wounds. So she's taking care of him. And what's interesting is that because he had been uh, so, so ill treated, um, he was physically close to death. He couldn't resent her first advances. He couldn't stop her from doing what she was doing. And then it became a ritual that he looked forward to for her ministrations. Ministrations. We want to look that up because we want to make sure we understand it. The act of ministering care or to administer care or religious service or aid. So since we know that she's taking care of him, we're going to go with the care part. So she is giving him care. Nig is less demonstrative. You can think demonstrate, but we pronounce it demonstrative. open exhibition or expression of emotions. So he doesn't show his emotions as much. But his eyes laugh, some personification there for you. Uh, so he has a good nature, which means he too is kind. Let's keep going. To Buck's surprise, these dogs manifested no jealousy toward him. They seemed to share the kindliness and largeness of John Thornton. As Buck grew stronger, they enticed him into all sorts of ridiculous games, in which Thornton himself could not forbear to join, and in this fashion Buck romped through his convalescence and into a new existence. Love, genuine passionate love, was his for the first time. This he had never experienced at Judge Miller's down in the sun-kissed Santa Clara Valley. With the judge's sons, hunting and tramping, it had been a working partnership. With the judge's grandsons, a sort of pompous guardianship, and with the judge himself, a stately and dignified friendship, but love that was feverish and burning, that was adoration, that was a madness it had taken John Thornton to arouse. So here, you're probably going to want to look up a number of words um, to be able to help you out. So manifested, to manifest, um, we want to look that up and make sure that you understand that. Something that here it says as an adjective readily perceived by the eye, but here these dogs manifested. The ED ending is one giveaway, but the dogs did something, or in this case didn't do something because there's a no, um, the thing that they didn't do. So we're going to go with the verb to make clear or evident, oops, to make clear or evident um, the, to the eye or understanding, to show plainly. So they did not show. I know that because I know how grammar works, and I know that after um, you have a subject, these dogs, you need a verb. Got that one for you. Um, as Buck grew stronger, in which Thornton could not forbear to join. This is not, you know, like the Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Ha ha ha. I'm so funny. Not really. Uh, to forbear. And again, um, he could not forbear. So here you have could, not, this has to be a verb. So we want to use some of the things that we've learned about grammar to be able to help us out. Thornton could not 
do something he couldn't keep from or hold back. So he couldn't hold back, which means he was feeling like he had to participate. It was so much fun. So Buck romped through his convalescence. I took for granted uh, when I was talking with one student that they would know what romped meant. So let's check that one out. To romp is to play or frolic, uh, to run or go rapidly without effort. Uh, so it's meant to be like fun uh, running around through his convalescence. Convalescence is a thing. Essence at the end lets us know that it's a noun. To convalesce would be the verb. Oops, I guess I didn't copy. So let's see what that means. Convalescence, the noun, is the gradual recovery um, of strength after an illness. So let's see. Um, I do want you to recognize that depending on the parts of speech, you can take the same word and make it different things. So here, um, convalescent is also a noun or an adjective. Convalescently is an adverb, but to convalesce would be... Um, the verb. See? Grammar is cool. Ha <laughs> ha ha. All right. Uh, and I also took for granted when I was talking with students about pompous. So I want to make sure that we understand all the vocabulary. So if you are pompous, um, you are characterized by an ostentatious display of dignity or importance. Wow. So that definition is not super helpful. <laughs> Basically, it would be kind of almost self-important, but over the top. So if he's got this like self-important display of his guardianship, like super proud of it. So what's interesting, I, I almost forgot this part. What's interesting about this section is we knew from the very first chapter that he was the king of the judge's domain. So here it begs you to think, well, he was king, so wouldn't he have been beloved? And there's a difference between, between being beloved and also being loved uh, intimately or personally. We talk about kings, and if you, if you think of the public's infatuation with the, the queen and her, well, her son, but also her grandsons in England, you know that there's that bit of affection the British have for their royal family, um, but it's, it's from afar. There's a major difference between an adoration from afar that's impersonal and something so personal where you just have this amazing trusting uh, friendship and kinship. And that's what he's experiencing here, which is so much more personal that it makes it uh, completely different and much better. And what's interesting is that he had to go through something so terribly difficult as in the what happens in the first five chapters to be able to get to this point. He would have never had this opportunity had he not been taken from his what he thought was a really good setting. Now, mind you, his life is not going to be perfect with John Thornton. He's still in Alaska. But he has now an opportunity to be encouraged to grow further um, because we need that kind of support to be able to continue to grow. So we'll see that. That's my prediction as we keep going. And this is how I want you to try to think about a text as you go. I want you to try to play the what-if game. Am I necessarily right with that prediction? No. Am I necessarily correct in the connections that I'm making in that that is what the author intended? I have no proof of that whatsoever. But as long as I can explain it, that's good enough for literary analysis. I didn't just 
give my point of view, I pointed to specific words and how you could interpret them as we were talking. And that is how we back up our argument, our, our claims that we have that are our analyses. Okay, enough talking about reading and writing and such. Let's actually get back to reading. This man had saved his life, which was something. But further, he was the ideal master. Other men saw to the welfare of their dogs from a sense of duty and business expediency. He saw to the welfare of his as if they were his own children, because he could not help it. And he saw further. He never forgot a kindly greeting or a cheering word, and to sit down for a long talk with them, gas as he called it, was as much his delight as theirs. He had a way of taking Buck's head roughly between his hands and resting his own head upon Buck's, of shaking him back and forth, the while calling him ill names that, to Buck, were love names. Buck knew no greater joy than that rough embrace and the sound of murmured oaths, and at each jerk back and forth it seemed that his heart would be shaken out of his body so great was its ecstasy. And when released he sprang to his feet, his mouth laughing, his eyes eloquent, his throat vibrant with unuttered sound, and in that fashion remained without movement. John Thornton would reverently exclaim, God, you can all but speak. Some of you uh, might get a little confused as to how it could be a sign of affection to use ill names. That doesn't mean he's sick. Um, but things that aren't necessarily socially acceptable. And in class, I talked about how my dad used to use, um, come here, you little, and he'd say something other than poop. <laughs> but he meant it and said it with a tone that let us know that he was being playful and joking around. And while I can't guarantee that's what John Thornton is doing here, it's reminiscent of that. It would be something similar to that. And the fact that he's grabbing Buck and roughly shaking him, that's like, you know, rubbing someone on the head a little bit to show him you love him or giving him a rough little uh, hug. It's his way of trying to show his affection. And Buck understands that. And what's interesting here is that then John Thornton sees the visible signs of Buck's joy, and he can interpret them. And he exclaims reverently, meaning almost in awe, that he is understanding Buck's return emotions and his own affection with this God you can all but speak. And now we see Buck's expression of love. Buck had a trick of love expression that was akin to hurt. He would often seize Thornton's hand in his mouth and close so fiercely that the flesh bore the impression of his teeth for some time afterward. And as Buck understood the oaths to be love words, so the man understood this feigned bite for a caress. So here we see a comparison between the rough embrace of John Thornton and his rough or callous words, and Buck does seemingly the same thing the way a dog can do it, by playfully biting John Thornton's hand, but doing it harder than most would probably expect. But they both understand one another. For the most part, however, Buck's love was expressed in adoration. While he went wild with happiness when Thornton touched him or spoke to him, he did not seek these tokens. Unlike Skeet, who was wont to shove her nose under Thornton's hand and nudge and nudge till petted, or Nig, who would stalk up and rest his great head on Thornton's knee, Buck was content to adore at a distance. He would lie by the hour, eager, alert, at Thornton's feet, looking up into his face, dwelling upon it, studying it, following with keenest interest each fleeting expression, every movement or change of feature. Or, as chance might have it, he would lie farther away, to the side or rear, watching the outlines of the man and the occasional movements of his body. And often, such was the communion in which they lived, the strength of Buck's gaze would draw John Thornton's head around, and he would return the gaze 
without speech, his heart shining out of his eyes as Buck's heart shone out. So here, this is talking about nonverbal communication between them. But up here, it's showing that Buck is literally almost idolizing. He's staring in adoration and wonder. And then John Thornton feels him staring at him. And they exchange uh, unspoken affection with just the way that they look at each other. So it shows the depth of that relationship, and they've only known each other for a short time. Sometimes you just connect, which is really cool. Ah. For a long time after his rescue, Buck did not like Thornton to get out of his sight. You can kind of imagine that because he might be a little bit scared. He's going to lose this guy. From the moment he left the tent to when he entered it again, Buck would follow at his heels. His transient masters, since he had come into the Northland, had bred in him a fear that no master could be permanent. He was afraid that Thornton would pass out of his life as Perrault and Francois and the Scotch half-breed had passed out. Even in the night, in his dreams, he was haunted by this fear. At such times, he would shake off sleep and creep through the chill to the flap of the tent where he would stand and listen to the sound of his master's breathing. That's so sad. But in spite of this great love he bore John Thornton, which seemed to bespeak the soft civilizing influence, the strain of the primitive, which the Northland had aroused in him, remained alive and active. Faithfulness and devotion, things born of fire and roof, were his, yet he retained his wildness and wiliness. He was a thing of the wild, come in from the wild to sit by John Thornton's fire, rather than a dog of the soft southland stamped with the marks of generations of civilization. Because of his very great love, he could not steal from this man, but from any other man in any other camp, he did not hesitate an instant, while the cunning with which he stole enabled him to escape detection. If you're struggling with this first little bit here, uh, it's extremely wordy, but you have two... Um, two dependent clauses that can almost be cut out. So in spite of this great love that he had that would seem to show that he's civilized, the strain of the primitive, that idea that he is more wolf than dog or, you know, wild dog um, that this journey has given him, that strain remained alive and active. So if you're struggling with this, you can take out what's in between the commas and just read what's left. But in spite of this great love he bore John Thornton, the strain of the primitive remained alive and active. Remember that dependent clauses, unless they are noun clauses, they're not actually essential to the idea of the sentence. You can take them out and the sentence should still make sense. They provide in some important details, but you don't actually need them. So if you're struggling with all of the wordiness, just read past them. That's the beauty of the commas. They let you know that you don't need to pay attention to them, at least not as much. Now, they follow along with that. The devotion, things born of fire and roof, there's a connection here. So again, it's so wordy. Faithfulness and devotion were his, yet he retained his wildness and wiliness. So you can just take out this part. It was a thing of the wild rather than a dog of the soft south land. So again, you can take out the part between the commas. That's just extra details. His face and body were scored by the teeth of many dogs, and he fought as fiercely as ever and more shrewdly. Skeet and Nig were too good-natured for quarreling. Besides, they belonged to John Thornton. But the strange dog, no matter what the breed or valor, swiftly acknowledged Buck's supremacy or found himself struggling for life with a terrible antagonist. And Buck was merciless. He had learned well the law of club and fang, and he never forewent an advantage or drew back from a foe he had started on the way to death. He had lessened from Spitz and from the chief fighting dogs of the police and mail, and knew there was no middle course. He must master or be mastered, while to show mercy was a weakness. Mercy did not exist in the primordial life. It was misunderstood for fear, and such misunderstandings made for death. Kill or be killed, eat or be eaten, was the law. And this mandate, 
down out of the depths of time he, o he obeyed. He was older than the days he had seen and the breaths he had drawn. This right here would be hyperbole, because obviously he can't be older than the days he had seen. It's just saying, like, you're wise beyond your, your, your years, things like that. He linked the past with the present, and the eternity behind him throbbed through him in a mighty rhythm to which he swayed as the tides and seasons swayed. He sat by John Thornton's fire, a broad-breasted dog, white-fanged and long-furred, but behind him were the shades of all manner of dog, half-wolves and wild wolves, urgent and prompting, tasting the savor of the meat he ate, thirsting for the water he drank, scenting the wind with him, listening with him, and telling him the sounds made by the wild life in the forest, dictating his moods, directing his actions, lying down to sleep with him when he lay down, and dreaming with him and beyond him, and becoming themselves the stuff of his dreams. Obviously, this whole thing is an exaggeration. He really does not have other dogs um, that are doing these things with him, other than, you know, Skeet and Nig, but they're not counted. This is just saying that he has all of those experiences that have made him uh, have such a varied past and such experience. So peremptorily did these shades beckon him that each day mankind and the claims of mankind slipped farther from him. Deep in the forest a call was sounding, and as often as he heard this call, mysteriously thrilling and luring, he felt compelled to turn his back upon the fire and the beaten earth around it, and to plunge into the forest, and on and on. He knew not where or why, nor did he wonder where or why, the call sounding imperilously deep in the forest. But as often as he gained the soft, unbroken earth and the green shade, the love for John Thornton drew him back to the fire again. And you're probably like, what on earth does that word mean? So let's take a look. Um, we may or may not actually find the actual word there. So peremptory is the, the base form of the word, which would be an adjective. So here, this, the illy at the end, instead of peremptory, peremptillary, uh, changes it to an adverb. But it's, the definition should be the same, leaving no opportunity for denial or refusal. So keep that in mind. Uh, sometimes if you don't find the exact word in the, defi in the dictionary, um, look at the ending. If it's just a slight alteration, it's probably an adjective turned into an adverb. The ly definitely gives that away. So here, that call sounding is ha 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 the title, the call of the wild. So he has this desire to go and to be wild, but he loves John Thornton so much that he always comes back again. Thornton alone held him. The rest of mankind was nothing. Chance travelers might praise or pet him, but he was cold under it all, and from a too demonstrative man he would get up and walk away. When Thornton's partners, Hans and Pete, arrived on the long-expected raft, Buck refused to notice them till he learned they were close to Thornton. After that, he tolerated them in a passive sort of way, accepting favors from them as though he favored them by accepting. They were of the same large type as Thornton, living close to the earth, thinking simply and seeing clearly. And ere they swung the raft into the big eddy by the sawmill at Dawson, they understood Buck and his ways, and did not insist upon an intimacy such as obtained with Skeet and Nig. Air would be before. For Thornton, however, his love seemed to grow and grow. He, alone among men, could put a pack upon Buck's back in the summer traveling. Nothing was too great for Buck to do when Thornton commanded. One day... They had grub-staked themselves from the proceeds of the raft and left Dawson for the headwaters of the Tana. Tanana. The men and dogs were sitting on a crest of the cliff which fell away, straight down to naked bedrock three hundred feet below. John Thornton was sitting near the edge, Buck at his shoulder. A thoughtless whim seized Thornton, and he drew the attention of Hans and Pete to the experiment he had in mind. Jump, Buck, he commanded, sweeping his arm out and over the chasm. 
The next instant he was grappling with Buck on the extreme edge while Hans and Pete were dragging them back to safety. It's uncanny, Pete said, after it was over, and they had caught their speech. So the cliff begins to break off, and he commands Buck to jump over it, this larger uh, now drop, and Buck does. Thornton shook his head. No, it is splendid, and it's terrible, too. Do you know, it sometimes makes me afraid. Now, how could it be both splendid and terrible? Splendid because it's an amazing thing that he was able to jump the greater distance, but terrible because John Thornton loves him and he doesn't want Buck to do something that'll hurt him. Him being Buck, not him being John Thornton. I'm not hankering to be the man that lays hands on you while he's around, Pete announced conclusively, nodding his head toward Buck. Hijingo was Hans' contribution, not myself either. It was at Circle City, ere the year was out, that Pete's apprehensions were realized. Black Burton, a man evil-tempered and malicious, had been picking a quarrel with a tenderfoot at the bar, when Thornton stepped good-naturedly between. Buck, as was his custom, was lying in a corner, head on paws, watching his master's every action. Burton struck out, without warning, straight from the shoulder. Thornton was sent spitting and saved himself from falling only by clutching the rail of the bar. Those who were looking on heard what was neither bark nor yelp, but a something which is best described as a roar, and they saw Buck's body rise up in the air as he left the floor for Burton's throat. The man saved his life by instinctively throwing out an arm, but was hurled backward to the floor with Buck on top of him. Buck loosed his teeth from the flesh of the arm and dove in again for the throat. This time, the man succeeded only in partly blocking, and his throat was torn open. Then the crowd was upon Buck, and he was driven off. But while a surgeon checked the bleeding, he prowled up and down, growling furiously, attempting to rush in, and being forced back by an array of hostile clubs. A miners' meeting called on the spot decided that the dog had sufficient provocation, and Buck was discharged. But his reputation was made, and from that day his name spread through every camp in Alaska. Okay, so if you're curious, um, what Pete had said here is, you know, wow, we realize that you and this dog have this amazing connection, so if anyone messes with you, I don't want to be around when Buck takes him on because they know that Buck will defend Thornton to the death. Um, so this guy, you know, steps in and um, he's like messing with someone. And so John Thornton tries to stop this quarrel and then Thornton gets sent spinning. And so Buck attacks and that's what happens. Later on in the fall of the year, he saved John Thornton's life in quite another fashion. The three partners were lining a long and narrow pooling boat down, pulling boat down a bad stretch of rapids on the 40-mile creek. Hans and Pete moved along the bank, snubbing with a thin manila rope from tree to tree, while Thornton remained in the boat, hopping its descent by means of a pole and shouting directions to the shore. Buck, on the bank, worried and anxious, kept abreast of the boat, his eyes never off his master. At a particularly bad spot where the, a ledge of barely submerged rocks jutted out into the river, Hans cast off the rope and, while Thornton pulled the boat out into the stream, ran down the bank with the end in his hand to snub the boat when it had cleared the ledge. Thus it did and was flying downstream in a current as swift as a mill race when Hans checked it with the rope and checked too suddenly. The boat flirted over and snubbed into the bank bottom up while Thornton, flung sheer out of it, was carried downstream toward the worst part of the rapids, a stretch of wild water in which no swimmer could live. So they're trying to get this boat down, um, and to keep it straight, they're working both on the boat and on shore, and they're trying to get it down these uh, rapids, if you will. So by pulling too quickly, he accidentally flips the boat, and John Thornton gets thrown out of it. Buck had sprung in on the instant, and at the end of 300 yards, amid a mad swirl of water, he overhauled Thornton. When he felt him grasp his tail, Buck headed for the bank, swimming with all his splendid strength. 
But the progress shoreward was slow, and the progress downstream amazingly rapid. From below came the fatal roaring, where the wild current went wilder and was rent in shreds, and sprayed by the rocks which thrust through like the teeth of an enormous comb. The suck of the water as it took the beginning of the last steep pitch was frightful, and Thornton knew that the shore was impossible. He scraped furiously over a rock, bruised across a second, and struck a third with crushing force. He clutched at its slippery top with both hands, releasing Buck, and above the roar of the churning water shouted, Go, Buck, go! So Buck is trying to save him, and he actually lets go of Buck because he, he doesn't feel that he's going to make sure. Buck could not hold his own, and swept on downstream, struggling desperately, but unable to win back. When he heard Thornton's command repeatedly, repeated, he partly reared out of the water, throwing his head high as though for a last look, then turned obediently toward the bank. He swam powerfully and was dragged ashore by Pete and Hans at the very point where swimming ceased to be possible and destruction began. They knew that the time a man could cling to a slippery rock in the face of that driving current was a matter of minutes, and they ran as fast as they could up the bank to the point far above where Thornton was hanging on. They attached the line with which they had been snubbing the boat to Buck's neck and shoulders, being careful that it should neither strangle him nor impede his swimming, and launched him into the stream. He struck out boldly, but not straight enough into the stream. He discovered that mistake too late, when Thornton was abreast of him and bare half dozen strokes away while he was being carried helplessly past. Hans promptly snubbed with the rope as though Buck were a boat. The rope thus tightening on him in the sweep of the current, he was jerked under the surface, and under the surface he remained till his body struck against the bank, and he was hauled out. He was half drowned, and Hans and Pete threw themselves upon him, pounding the breath into him and the water out of him. He staggered to his feet and fell down. The faint sound of Thornton's voice came to them, and though they could not make out the word of it, they knew that he was in his extremity. His master's voice acted on Buck like an electric shock. He sprang to his feet and ran up the bank ahead of the men to the point of his previous departure. Again the rope was attached and he was launched, and again he struck out, but this time straight into the stream. He had miscalculated once, but he would not be guilty of it a second time. Hans paid out the rope, permitting no slack, while Pete kept it clear of coils. Buck held on till he was on a line straight above Thornton. Then he turned, and with the speed of an express train, he headed down upon him. Thornton saw him coming, and as Buck struck him like a battering ram with the whole force of the current behind him, he reached up and closed with both arms around the shaggy neck. Hans snubbed the rope around the tree, and Buck and Thornton, were jerked under the water, strangling, suffocating, and sometimes one uppermost and sometimes the other, dragging over the jagged bottom, smashing against rocks and snags, they veered into the bank. Thornton came too, belly downward, and being violently propelled back and forth across a drift log by Hans and Pete. His first glance was for Buck, over whose limp and apparently lifeless body Niggs was setting up a howl while Skeet was licking the wet face and closed eyes. Thornton was himself bruised and battered, and he went carefully over... Buck's body, when he had been brought around, finding three broken ribs. That settles it, he announced. We camp right here. And camp they did, till Buck's ribs knitted and he was able to travel. Okay, I know I ended up talking kind of fast with that, but sometimes when you're reading, you want, especially if you read aloud, you want to try to convey the action of what's happening. And the fact that this scene was extremely riveting. The fact that this scene was all fast-paced and there was a sense of urgency required me to read it quickly for you, to, to bring you along as quickly as they might be feeling it themselves. So you can take just a second and look back over that, but it's really important that we're able to try to feel just how urgent everything was for them at that point in time. Okay, let's begin again. That winter at Dawson, Buck performed another exploit, not so heroic perhaps, but one that put his name many notches higher on the totem pole of Alaskan fame. Not really a totem pole. This exploit was particularly gratifying to the three men, for they stood in need of the outfit which it furnished, and were enabled to make a long-desired trip into the virgin east, where miners had not yet appeared. It was brought about by a conversation in the El Dorado Saloon, in which men waxed boastfully of their favorite dogs. Buck, because of his record, was the target for these men, and Thornton was driven stoutly to defend him. 
At the end of half an hour, one man stated that his dog could start a sled with 500 pounds and walk off with it. A second bragged 600 for his dog, and a third, 700. Pooh pooh, said John Thornton. Buck can start a thousand pounds. Okay, first of all, pooh pooh, whatever. But here, um, there's a bit of foreshadowing, and there's also the the reasoning. Um, the reason they'd want to go into the virgin east, where miners had not yet appeared, is because remember they're searching for gold. So if they can get to a part where no one has been, they're going to be more likely to succeed in finding gold because no one's been there before to look for it. All right. So let's pick back up and break it out and walk off with it for a hundred yards, demanded Mathewson. A bonanza king, he of the 700 vaunt, and break it out and walk off with it for a hundred yards, John Thornton said coolly. <laughs> well, Mathewson said, slowly and deliberately, so that all could hear, I've got a thousand dollars that says he can't. And there it is. So saying, he slammed a sack of gold dust the size of a bologna sausage down upon the bar. Nobody spoke. Thornton's bluff, if bluff it was, had been called. He could feel a flush of warm blood creeping up his face. His tongue had tricked him. He did not know whether Buck could start a thousand pounds. Half a ton. Math time. <laughs> a ton is two thousand pounds, in case you didn't know. The enormousness of it appalled him. He had a great faith in Buck's strength and had often thought him capable of starting such a load, but never as now had he faced the possibility of it. The eyes of a dozen men fixed upon him, silent and waiting. Further, he had no thousand dollars, nor had Hans and Pete. We've got a sled standing outside now with twenty-five pound sacks of flour on it. Matthewson went on with brutal directness, so don't let that hinder you. Thornton did not reply. He did not know what to say. He glanced from face to face in the absent way of a man who has lost the power of thought and is seeking somewhere to find the thing that will start it going again. The face of Jim O'Brien, a Mastodon King and old-time comrade, caught his eyes. It was a cue to him, seeming to rouse him to do what he would never have dreamed of doing. Can you lend me a thousand, he asked, almost in a whisper. Sure, answered O'Brien, thumping down a plethoric sack by the side of Mathewson's. A plethora is like a lot, so plethoric would be describing that. Though it's little faith I'm having, John, <laughs> the beasts can do the trick. The Eldorado emptied its occupants into the street to see the test. The tables were deserted, and the dealers and gamekeepers came forth to see the outcome of the wager and to lay odds. Several hundred men, furred and mittened, banked around the sled within easy distance. Matthewson's sled, loaded with a thousand pounds of flour, had been standing for a couple hours, and in the intense cold, it was sixty below zero, the runners had frozen fast to the hard-packed snow. Men offered odds of two to one that Buck could not budge the sled. A quibble arose concerning the phrase, break out. O'Brien contended it was Thornton's privilege to knock the runners loose, leaving Buck to break it out from a dead standstill. Mathewson insisted that the phrase included breaking the runners from the frozen grip of the snow. A majority of the men who had witnessed the making of the bet decided in his favor, whereat the odds went up to three to one against Buck. And this is one of those famous scenes from the movie that we watched. So, you can imagine the scene as we read about it. There were no takers. Not a man believed him capable of the feat. Thornton had been hurried into the wager, heavy with doubt, and now that he looked at the sled itself, the concrete fact with the regular team of ten dogs curled up in the snow before it, the more impossible the task appeared. Mathewson waxed jubilant. Three to one, he proclaimed. I'll lay you another thousand at that figure, Thornton. What do you say? Thornton's doubt was strong in his face, but his fighting spirit was aroused. The fighting spirit that soars above odds fails to recognize the impossible and is deaf to all save the clamor for battle. He called Hans and Pete to him. Their sacks were slim, and with his own, the three partners could rake together only $200. In the ebb of their fortunes, this sum was their total capital, yet they laid it unhesitatingly against Matthew's six, Matthewson's 600. I wish he was just Matthew instead of Matthewson. 
The team of ten dogs was unhitched, and Buck, with his own harness, was put into the sled. He had caught the contagion of the excitement, and he felt that in some way he must do a great thing for John Thornton. Have you ever noticed that animals sometimes, like, they they get what's going on around them even though they can't actually understand? It's just, like, the feeling uh, just gives them, like, some sense of it, whether it's good or bad. Murmurs of admiration at his splendid appearance went up. He was in perfect condition, without an ounce of superfluous flesh, and 150 pounds that he weighed were so many pounds of grit and virility. His furry coat shone with the sheen of silk. Down the neck and across the shoulders, his mane, in repose as it was, half bristled, and seemed to lift with every movement, as though excess of vigor made each particular hair alive and active. The great beast and heavy forelegs were no more than in proportion with the rest of his body, where the muscles showed in tight rolls underneath the skin. Men felt these muscles and proclaimed them hard as iron, and the odds went down to two to one. I'm going to stop for a quick second. I know we haven't finished this entire scene, but what's interesting here and what we need to remember, I know sometimes reading books from a long time ago, more than books that are written nowadays, tend to put a lot more effort into the description of things, other than if you're reading something that's creating its own world, like uh, science fiction or a fantasy type of realm. Um, and that's because we now have more... Um, just more general knowledge of stuff that we haven't personally experienced thanks to things like the internet and television and um, movies and stuff like that. So it was the job of the author back then to give your reader enough information to be able to create the mental picture. So keep that in mind. Um, the texts themselves are, are still really, really well done. They might seem like they spend a lot of time describing, but it's really because they needed to. You didn't have the same set of background information or the availability to get even images the way that we do now. So keep that in mind and kind of respect the effort that the authors go into putting into these descriptions. Try to get a mental picture even though we saw the movie. Okay, back to the text. Gad, sir, gad, sir, stuttered a member of the latest dynasty, a king of the Skookum benches. I offer you eight hundred for him, sir, before the test. Eight hundred, just as he stands. Thor shook his head and stepped over to Buck's side. You must stand off from him, Mathewson protested. Free play and plenty of room. The crowd fell silent. Only could be heard the voices of the gamblers vainly offering two to one. Everybody acknowledged Buck a magnificent animal, but twenty-five pound sacks of flour bulked too large in their eyes for them to loosen their pouch strings. Thornton knelt down by Buck's side. He took his head in his hands and rested cheek on cheek. Notice that this is going to be similar to that, that affection that he showed earlier on in the chapter. He did not playfully shake him, as was his wont, or murmur soft love curses, but he whispered in his ear, As you love me, Buck, as you love me, was what he whispered. Buck whined with suppressed eagerness. So he's evoking in him and you should remember uh, that same affection. If you, if you f truly love me, this is what I'm asking of you, is what he's trying to tell Buck. The crowd was watching curiously. The affair was growing mysterious. It seemed like a conjuration. As Thornton got to his feet, Buck seized his mittened hand between his jaws, pressing in with his teeth and releasing slowly, half reluctantly. It was the answer in terms, not of speech, but of love. Thornton stepped well back. So you see, Buck returns the affection, which is his reply. He's going to do whatever he can for the man that he loves. And also conjuration. To conjure something is to create, um, almost kind of mysteriously, which ties in here, <laughs> or even you could say magically. Something does not seem like it's natural. It seems of the supernatural. Now, Buck, he said. Buck tightened in the traces, then slapped them for a matter of several inches. It was the way he had learned. Gee! Thornton's voice rang out, sharp in the tense silence. Buck swung, 
to the right, ending the movement in a plunge that took up the slack and with a sudden jerk arrested his 150 pounds. The load quivered, and from under the runners arose a crisp crackling. Ha! Thornton commanded. Buck duplicated the maneuver this time to the left. The crackling turned into a snapping, the sled pivoting and the runners slipping and grating several inches to the side. The sled was broken out. Men were holding their breaths, intensely unconscious of the fact. Now mush! Thornton's command cracked out like a pistol shot. Buck threw himself forward, tightening the traces with a jarring lunge. His whole body was gathered compactly together in the tremendous effort, the muscles writhing and nodding like live things under the silky fur. His great chest was low to the ground, his head forward and down, while his feet were flying like mad, the claws scarring the hard-packed snow in parallel grooves. The sled swayed and trembled, half started forward. One of his feet slipped, and one man groaned aloud. The sled lurched ahead in what appeared a rapid succession of jerks, though it never really came to a dead stop again. Half an inch, an inch, two inches. The jerks perceptibly diminished, and the sled gained momentum. He caught them up till it was moving steadily along. Men gasped and began to breathe again, unaware that for a moment they had ceased to breathe. Thornton was running behind, encouraging Buck with short, cheery words. The distance had been measured off, and as he neared the pile of firewood, which marked the end of the hundred yards, a cheer began to grow and grow, which burst into a roar as he passed the firewood and halted at command. Every man was tearing himself loose, even Matthewson. Hats and mittens were flying in the air. Men were shaking hands, it did not matter with whom, and bubbling over in a general incoherent babble. So even if they won or lost the betting, they're all in awe of Buck's ability to, to do this amazing task. But Thornton fell on his knees beside Buck. Head was against head, and he was shaking him back and forth. There's the finish of the love. Those who hurried up heard him cursing Buck, and he cursed him long and fervently, and softly and lovingly. Gad, sir, gad, sir, sputtered the Skookum Bench King. I'll give you a thousand for him, sir, a thousand, sir, twelve hundred, sir. Thornton rose to his feet. His eyes were wet, crying. The tears were streaming frankly down his cheeks. Sir, he said to the Skookum Bench King, no, sir, you can go to hell, sir. It's the best I can do for you, sir. Buck seized Thornton's hand in his teeth. Thornton shook him back and forth. As though animated by a common impulse, the onlookers drew back to a respectful distance, nor were they again indiscreet enough to interrupt. End of the chapter. So, I hope you enjoyed that, and we will continue with chapter 7. I'll have that ready for you guys as well. But remember to take your close notes as we read because we want to make sure that even though I'm pointing some things out to you, maybe there's something that I missed or in some of the sections especially that I might have kind of gotten caught up in the action, um, there might be something that you think is worth pointing out that I didn't. Great job and remember there's just one chapter left. It's exciting.